listening to the Startup Scale-Up Show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs to create meaningful businesses and pursue their passions. My name is Demi Samande and I am a furniture manufacturer, best known for documenting my move to Lagos, Nigeria for hopes of business opportunities. And I'm sitting down with entrepreneurs from across the continent to talk about their process, the lessons they have learned and how to make real impact. Welcome to Susu. Joining me on today's episode is a newly appointed president of the Association of Advertising Agencies of Nigeria, AAAN, Steve Babayako, an advertising and music executive, founder of Extreme Ideas, a Lagos-based digital advertising agency that was listed in 2017 as a one of Nigeria's fastest growing communication agencies. Steve is also the founder and CEO of Extreme Music, a record label that has talent such as Nigerian singer-songwriter Simi. He was on the 2018 jury of the New York Advertising Festival, where he was a keynote speaker. He began his career in advertising back in 1995 with MC&A, Sashi and Sashi, Primo Gannett, and 141 Worldwide, garnishing an impressive 22 years of experience before he subsequently left in 2012 to set up Extreme Ideas. Steve, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to Susu Podcast. Thank Absolute you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our new triple A N. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> We've avoided the tongue twister. This is Absolutely. that was strictly for you, Ariola. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, it's been about two weeks. About two weeks. About yeah, two about, weeks yeah. when the announcement yeah. was made. Yeah. We had a conversation. Well, I had the heads up, didn't I? Really? Yeah. yeah I knew yeah, it was yeah, going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I had the insight quite early. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you very super, much. Super, super impressive. A long time coming. I think it's been a long journey for me, really. Uh, it's mm. just a good place to finally sort of land with my two feet in. You yeah. Know, just realizing how many of the iconic people uh, in advertising, who have occupied the same seats, people like Bjorn Shubanjo, uh, Mrs. Bola Thomas, uh, you know, Lulu Akumi, you know, mm. and so many, and Yodibu. I mean, to finally have to share the same spotlight with these huge iconic people, it's, it's a privilege, really. Well, they definitely carried the torch, didn't they? And they and did. it's, it's a it's a great seat. Um, to to sort of take over absolutely i totally agree with and you. i i don't i don't think anybody would disagree disagree with me that there's nobody else more deserving particularly in these times uh where nigeria advertising has really come a long way hasn't it it's come a huge way and yeah. those names that you mentioned yeah. def- definitely did pay it forward no definitely they opened the doors for the likes of us you know and uh for me about what i've been deserving being the person that's more deserving that I'm not sure. That's don't that's be so up, modest that's now. Up, that's up in the air for debate. <laughs> but one thing I know, I like, I realize that in 47 years of uh, AAA and being in existence, this this year was the first time we had our AGM mm. online. So I ah. tell them, I tell everybody, you can now call me the digital president. The d- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no better title. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So since you've you fallen into the role, what, what's what's been your first sort of yeah, first point of call. What's been the first things you guys had to sort of delve into as a new president? So many things, to be honest. Uh, you know how it is when you really want something so badly all your life and then it finally happens. Are you then, numb? Yeah, Were you numb? That's for a microsecond, you're numb because you realize, <laughs> okay, now I want it. Now you have it. So yes. what are you going to do with it? So th- those are the issues we're grappling with. But we moved on real quick. Mm. The good thing is that I really have a solid team behind me. I have... Perhaps, I don't know if with the kind of caliber of people on the board that I have with me supporting me, I don't think it's more, it's very extremely difficult to fail. You're not going you know? to fail. So, so those are the people who keep challenging us, who of keep course. pushing the envelope and telling us, okay, this is what we should do. Yeah. And I really, really appreciate that. Fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations Thank again. Thank you very much. But before we even, before we go into Steve Araiko's story, sure. You know, give us. I always like to start with the backstory, and I'm yeah. sure that everybody watching and listening also <laughs> wants to understand the formula, yeah. the, the the ingredients, <laughs> the concoction yeah. that goes into creating. I like concoction. I, so do I. <laughs> it's my new thing now. So the concoction that goes into creating 
the persona, the the, yeah. the individual, the man. Um, tell us a little bit, a little bit, and a little history about your upbringing. I know you've spoken about your childhood quite sure, a fair sure. bit, but I want you to go a little bit deeper for me, only because I'm special, of course. Okay, of course. Yeah, Give me a definitely. little backstory. You know, what was what was it? What was it like growing up for Steve? For me, uh, it's a it's a little mixture of bitter and sweet. You know, I mean, sweet because. I mean, I'm first of six children. Oh wow! Out my dad, my lovely dad, David Daddy, I'm a late now. Uh, my dad passed in 1990, as I was just about to enter college or uni. Mm. And then my mom, thankfully, is still alive. Christina Funke Babaiko. My my, but I think I was just 10 years old. I'm I'm writing my memoirs now. Oh, you are? Yeah, oh, yeah. that's interesting. I, I'm almost done with it now. We're mm. in the edit stage. So I think I was 10 years old, about 10 years old, when I realized that we were poor, that we were Ooh. poor. It just hit me. I mean, I was about 10 years old. when. What happened? Then I just realized then I couldn't afford most of the things that some of my friends could afford, mm. you know, uh, you know, and my trousers were torn, you know, wow. and I had no shoes and I had... Even though a, a president of this country once claimed he had no shoes for <laughs> no one to wow. measure shoes with the guy, <laughs> you know, yeah. So yeah, I, it just occurred to me then that we were poor, and then I, I, I didn't know what to make of it. But uh, I kept on though, uh, because my dad now tried to juggle career. He was one guy who was really fiercely pushy about to make life better for his family. He really fought for his family till the very end, you know. So he jumped from being a teacher and ruled to be an army officer just <clears throat> almost immediately after the Civil War. So mm. we were in Uweri for a bit, you know. we I lived in one of those army batches along Olu Road, you know, so I, that was my childhood. And then I, I had to go back to Kaduna, then came back to my town in Kaba in Kugi State. You know, and and he struggled to the very end to just make ends meet, but things just didn't. Work. He's one of those. He was one of those guys who tried everything, and things just did not. The stars just didn't align for him. So, I I learned a lot from him, just how to keep fighting for your family. You know, until now, uh, everybody in my family knows I I will fight till the end. Fight to the end. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. ten years old. Yeah. I'm I'm thinking about that, and I'm just wondering what kind of what sort of state of mind would you have been in at ten years old? Would you say it was traumatic the realization that you were poor? Not not really. I just knew okay, this was is what it is. You know, yes. it was what it was then. You know, and uh, I knew okay, how do you accept this? Since growing up, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, I think by sixteen, I finally realized that look, you know what, I had two choices to make. Stay in this situation where I already know not much is going to happen. My dad and my mom, they love me with all their lives and everything. But there's very little they could do to to change my life, basically. Mm. You know, or just pick my bag and go out there and take a shot. Hmm. At 16 years not old. Not knowing what's going to happen to me, but just go out there and give myself another shot at life. I, I chose the the latter. I picked up my bag and I left home. Hmm. So where did you go at 16? I was in Kaduna. I was just on the streets of Kaduna. So, I mean, even though I'm from Kogi State, I'm a proud Kogi citizen. I'm from Kaba in Kogi State. But I have to say, the state of Kaduna raised me. Hmm. You know, I mean, I grew up on those streets. I, I got to understand what it means to, to get to make a decent living. And even at 16, I realized that drugs, crime, were not just going to be part of my story. I wanted you already my, had an identity I, you I wanted, wanted to go with. I, yeah. I wanted my story to be about just hope and overcoming adversity. And uh, I realized that education has to be, will be a crucial part of my story. So I just worked to raise money to go to school. By yourself? By myself. So you put yourself through school? Inshallah. Wow. <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine... The, the mental strength it would have taken a 16 year old to not only especially if you're if you're surrounded by what could have gone the other mm -hmm, way sure. the drugs the, I the, could street, have been the in lifestyle I, yes. I, tell, I tell people i could have been in jail easily because mm. I, I also had friends who ended up in jail to, to be honest yes. you know so you know it was 
the mixed bag of all kinds of people. But I was I was determined because I realized I used to tell myself what at sixteen years old, you know, I go for a long stroll from I used to stay uh fifteen Bagarua Road, Costin Quarters, that was her house, uh, where I was courting with God knows who. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would take a stroll, then I'll go to like Meduguri Road and Kigo Road. For anybody who's familiar with Kaduna will understand that that's a bit of a distance. So I'll take s- such long walks in the evening. And I used to imagine myself telling my siblings to say, you know what, guys, education is good. You guys have to get educated. And I used to imagine their response. Maybe I would imagine myself, I'm already 40 years old, telling them this. And they ask me, how do you know education is good? How much of education do you have yourself? And that response used to sh- to scare the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, then I have to get educated because then it puts me in the moral high ground to adv- advise my siblings to get the same thing as well. So uh, that that really helped me. So six siblings. How many were above or be- or below you? Where where were you? No, we're all six. Uh, five other siblings. Then I, I was I was, I'm the first. You're the first. Yeah, then Huge I have five other responsibility. No, no. Everybody who went to who got any kind of education in my family i paid for it i'm really proud to wow. say that. yeah oh wow because i started fighting for the family since i was like 16, since 17, you were 16. Yeah. so what's the first sort of jobs you were doing to in order to support yourself and put yourself through school yes uh a gentleman engineer rafael drawy who grew up with my grandfather you see he was so stubborn when he was young he's seven five years old in a few months now you know, he grew up with my grandfather and he, his father was friends with my grandfather. So uh, because he was so stubborn, they took him to my grandfather's stay. So my grandfather actually raised him for a bit. Mm. You know, after then he got a job as the chief engineer for Doba Hotel in Kaduna. He was the one that was staying, who was my mentor. And he was the first person to recognize the talent that I had in writing. So I would just go there in Dover Hotel and I would do some writings for him, you know, and that's how. Is that uh, fancy writing or what, what sort fa- of writing? Just, just communi- very creative. Com- communi- not even creative, communication, like business letters, correspondence okay. to his GM. He was a, G- he was a chief engineer. No way. And then uh, the GM of the hotel, they see, saw the kind of memos he wrote coming from his office, they used to call him Engineer Maturinchi. You know, so I mean, the engineer that writes good English. Ah. <laughs> so when the GM wants to write to his own MD at Ariwa Hotel's headquarters, they bring it, they, they brought it to my uncle to write. And I, I, I was the one doing all the drafting then. You know, that's how, that's the kind of job I did. But alongside of, uh, apart from that, I would do washing of his car, you know, take the kids on lessons, you know, and any kind of odd jobs that came along, you know, mm. yeah. And that was what I did for so many years to raise money. And for that, he paid me, he was magnanimous enough to pay me enough money for me to pay for my education, you know. That's that's, that's very, very fascinating. Yeah. And I, I never would have imagined that was the necessarily the story. Because I know that I, I did hear the story, you know, yeah. you, you grew up relatively poor, at least you thought you grew so. up very relatively poor. But I, I think it's it, it definitely does say a lot about character of a of a young child mm-hmm. um to be that steadfast you know to I'm, be really focused like i'm that. happy i'm happy for the grace to just stay the course and just realize that you know all of the short time gains that most people want now are probably going to be uh, a road to nowhere or a road to disaster that's going to end up in tears you know but i uh, just be able to identify that look if you stay the course it's going to be the hard road to travel or you might be able to smile for longer, you know, because if I have any kind of criminal activity hanging on my neck, maybe way back from Kaduna <laughs> now, you don't know how it can come to bite you in the behind today. And hmm. it does happen a lot, a lot of times, you know, when you think you've run, you, you, you've escaped from all of the crimes you did in, the, in your past and they come to catch up with you. So I, I'm I'm picturing this young kid who used to have flashbacks of the future <laughs> and then somehow self-adjusts 
their behavior yeah. based on whatever that flashback showed so, him. That's what so, I'm picturing in my true. mind. <laughs> and, and it's a good flashback to have maybe just for me as a general. Was it a flash forward? It'd be a flash forward, not a flash Whether back. you flash it back or flash it forward, <laughs> just know that it's going to catch up with you if it's the wrong thing that you're doing. You know what I mean? You know, mm. yeah. All right, so from copy or even f- sort of from writing for your uncle mm-hmm. um, to now moving and transitioning to the advertising mm-hmm. um, space, how, how did that how did that journey come about for you? Well, it started because actually before even writing, I didn't even know, before I even knew anything about writing, I was writing, but I didn't even know it was something that would sustain me in the future. I always wanted to be a broadcaster. I wanted to be in your seat. <laughs> you know, just either be on radio or be on TV, you know, mm. whatever, whatever, you know, but particularly on TV. I, I was passionate about TV. And then I made sure that I got posted to NTA Kano when I, I was I served with uh, in Kano State and I got posted to NTA Kano. And I, 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 I fought tooth and nail to make sure I got posted to NTA Kano because for me it was, I just felt that's what, that was what was, was going to jumpstart my my broadcasting career, right? And then I got there. And in one or two months flat, the bubble just burst because I realized I saw people look really, really damn pretty on TV. Well, when it was t- after casting the news or whatever, they didn't dare to go home. Uh, they start looking for money to to get Okada. I'm like, oh, oh wow. Oh, wow. Uh, I, this is not what I said. Okay. I, I come from this family of six people. I'm already sending money I have home. bills to pay. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> this is not going to work. So I, for a long time, I really didn't know what to do with myself. And I remember in 1995, like around March, my, my, the end, expiration of my service year was in June of 95. By March, I, I just suddenly started having serious insomnia i wasn't sleeping anymore because every night i was awake just thinking what's going to happen with my life what's the next step now broadcasting is not going to be it so what next and then i remember reading uh an article some kind of uh interview about what my former boss mr akimumi he granted that interview and he talked about advertising talked about propaganda and all of the things they do for their staff. I'm like, yeah, this sounds exciting. Mm. So I remember always taking a walk from uh, uh, Costing Quarters to go to the Cardinal Library to just research because I wanted to know more about advertising. I could sing almost all these jingles on radio and on TV, but I didn't even understand that. I didn't realize the existence of advertising as an employment uh, sector that will hire people that you could do for a living. I didn't know that, you know, Cardinal people <laughs> were usually the last people to hear the news that was happening in Lagos then, uh. you know. So I used to go to the Cardinal Library to just research about advertising and then I discovered creative department, I discovered copywriting and then I realized, hey, I could do this, you know. Because and then not looking <laughs> for money to go home at the end of the, uh, the day. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that was sorted because of the interview that Mr. Kiyomi granted. So I think that really, really uh, helped uh, shed a new light on that new career path, which I then took, you know. Hmm. So when you started in advertising, tell me what that what, what that looks like. What, what was the entry level for you? It was, <laughs> for the first time, uh, yeah, uh, I think I started September 1, 1995. I arrived Lagos June 8, 1995. You know, I got to Ajota and I was not sure where I was even going to live. And I had, true story, I had 500 bucks in my pocket. 500? Naira. 500 Naira yeah, coming that, into Lagos? Yeah, that was the last money that I had coming into Lagos. And then... I realized, oh yeah, my uncle used to be the chief engineer in Doba Hotel, mile two in Lagos. So I went there, told some really long, long, longer story to the GM, who graciously allowed me to stay with the chef. Another long story, yeah. So I did that, and I was from there. I hit the road the next day with my five hundred bucks, looking for a job. Mm. So I had already written to my boss, Mr. Akumi, who I read this in interview. I, re- I wrote him from Cardinal to say, yeah, I graduated top of my class. Uh, I studied drama and I, your interview really inspired me. I really want to start practicing advertising. I didn't get any response, 
but I came anyway. So I went to Primagane, tried to see him. I couldn't see him. I stayed for like two hours. Eventually, I saw him, and you know that didn't really yield any result. All right, tell me what you said. Okay, <laughs> I was kept at the reception for okay. how long? For like two hours. You know, they told me I want to see such and such. Oh, do you have an appointment? I said no. Okay, sorry, you can see him. I'm like, you guys don't understand. I came all the way from Karina. I I've already to, spent my 500 bucks. <laughs> I have to see this man, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> I just won't budge. I just won't leave. So I'm sure he kept on checking on, is the guy gone? No, he's not gone. So <laughs> eventually, after two hours, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Mr. Akumi, after two hours, he saw me eventually. And then, yeah, so I said, yeah, I'm the, I'm the guy who wrote you a letter from Karina. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, okay, I'm here now. I need a job. <laughs> oh, wow. And he said, oh, we don't have any job right now, but I normally wouldn't do this, but just look out in the papers. We're going to run a vacancy ad soon. Respond to that ad and we'll take it from there. And like, at least I heard what I wanted to hear. I was grateful. I left. But a friend of mine had give, give me a, a card, a call card, of some gentleman called Tunji Adeninka. He's the group MD of Connect Marketing today. That he worked in MCNA, Sachi and Sachi. So I took the card. So I left Magadet in Lupeju and I went to Shonibari Estate where uh, MCNA was located at the time. So I, I asked to see the uh, uh, to see Tunji Adeninka only to be shocked by by someone telling me Tunje had left the agency two years before then. Oh, wow. <laughs> so as I was about to turn to go, then it suddenly occurred to me, but Tunji Adinka is not the managing director of this company. So if there's a job vacancy here, somebody should be able to tell me, I, nobody than the managing director would be in a position to, a better position to tell me. So I said, I wanted to see the MD. And they asked me, do you have an appointment? Was it the same day? Same or day. Oh, same wow. day. Same day. And I said, yes and no. Yes, I have an appointment, but no, he doesn't know that I'm coming today, <laughs> which is not exactly correct. Because <laughs> not exactly true because I didn't have an appointment. So they gave me a note to write to say who I am and why the purpose for visit, you know. So I just wrote a, la- a lawyer friend because and. I probably wrote my first copy that day because I was thinking, what can I what write can that would compel say, yes. this man to see me? So I wrote, a lawyer friend from Karina told me to see you. I was just trying to, I'm hoping against hope that Nigerians don't want to hear anything about lawyers and legal things. He doesn't want to ignore that letter, no. So I wrote it. And two minutes, he said they should bring me up. But I was lucky. I was reading a magazine in just on the coffee table where, while I was waiting. And I, the magazine wrote a profile about the man I was about to see. And I was consuming those information so fast. You know, I was reading, and I saw that he worked in Sona Dairies. He worked in a couple of places before be taking up the current job he had at the time. So when he, I got in and the, as the door opened, the first thing he said to me, young man, what's the, all this lawyer business? I'm like, sorry, sir. <laughs> So what's the name of your friend? I told him one random name. And I said, well, he did tell me in fairness to him that you may not remember him because he knew you when you used to work in Sona Dairies. Oh my God, I can't believe <laughs> <laughs> And the guy said, he called the name like a few times, called the name. I said, I don't remember. Him. Yeah. I said, he said so that you may not remember him. But he did say one other thing though, that if there's, one man in this town that can give me a job. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is you. Now, guys, that's how you get a job. <laughs> and the guy says, sit down. And I sat down. I was talking about everything from politics to sports to anything. Yeah. And five minutes into the conversation, he picked up his phone and called the receptionist. I don't want to take any call. I don't want to see anybody until I'm done with this gentleman. Mm. And then we talked and he asked me questions. How old was this gentleman at the time? Very, was he considerably older than you? No, no. Well, Victor Johnson was probably, probably around almost 80 now. He would probably oh, wow. be around uh, f- late 50s then, 58 or 60 then. Wow. So he was, he was no, a mature gentleman. Older. I was like maybe 24. Then you definitely well, impressed well, him yeah, then, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. 
So I mean, we we had we we had nice conversation, and he was really really generous and pleasant. So when I was done, and he said, "Where do you stay?" I told him I was staying in Scotland with the chef in the hotel. Well, how? What money do you have? I don't have any money, but I know I'm going to get by. And then he picked up his briefcase, opened it, and gave me maybe five thousand naira or two thousand. I can't really remember. Brand okay. new crispy notes. Brand new. And I said, Did your heart fl- fluster? I wanted to die because I mean that was like <laughs> that was like <laughs> that's a lot of money. That's like winning the jackpot for me at the time. Mm. So he said, "Take it." I'm like, "I'm sorry, sir. I can't possibly." Take this. Say, are you crazy? Am I not old enough to be your dad? Take it. There so he gave it to me. And then he said they, they didn't have any job. And I'm like, I don't even want a job. I just want a test. I know I can do this job. Just give me a test. Wow. And then he said, no job. So I, I took the money. I was about to head out. Got to the door and he called me. I looked back. And he said, come back next Thursday. We'll give you a th- test. If you're as good as you say you are, we'll give you a job. Wow. I came, did the test, and the rest, like they say. 1995 to now, how many years is that? Almost 25 years wow. ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The rest is history. What a story. Yeah, but I'm forever grateful to Mr. Victor Johnson. He 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 gave me a lifeline. I'll never forget it. How, no. He's still alive today. I love him. January 6th, every year is his birthday, and even if I'm in the moon, I'll call him. He must be so proud of you. I'm sure he is. Wow. I'm what sure a story. Yeah. You know, many, many, many people of our generation, um, and I know this conversation happens a fair bit, that grit and that that resilience, that that um that willingness to just to do whatever it took in the most honest oh. way possible, mm-hmm. to just do whatever it takes to prove yourself. You you have to. I mean, even today, nobody 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 really wants to do that. Even today, I know people who are even more hundred million times more successful than I am. Who I still see them pulling so much work, and I know in their hearts, they don't have to prove themselves to anybody, but they are proving themselves to themselves. You know, and those are the people who really really inspire me, even in my life's journey today. To say, every day you have to prove to the universe why you still have to be a human being. Yeah, deserve to be just to devise, deserve, deserve the spots they've given you here on earth because it's a privilege big privilege big big For, privilege. that test alone might i think at the time might have seemed like oh yeah. what a huge weight yeah, yeah. but what a privilege it because is. that's what pretty much changed the trajectory of your life absolutely that's an amazing story i'm yeah. i'm very inspired Thank by you. that absolutely inspired and i and i think that it's it, it says a lot about somebody's character because it's it's quite humbling isn't it yeah man it's a I, very humble place to you know they're to tired, start. but to be honest i i just knew every time that i reflect back i knew the journey has to either end this way or maybe in that because there's no other way mm. it's this way or maybe not present here because I remember there was a time I went to see a friend of mine. He used to work in the Papa. We, we finished college uni together and he was he already had a job at the Papa. And I went to see him and uh the last of the money I had, that was even before shortly after the Victor Johnson experience because between uh June when I saw him, it took up to two months before I finally got the job. So I resumed September in nineteen. So was that two months of test? Two, two months of test. Did that did that five thousand naira go all the way? It didn't. <laughs> did it give <laughs> you more? I splodged a little bit and I tried to just eat better than I was eating before. Before yeah. I knew the money was gone. So in between that period, I had to go see my friend in Papa with the last box that I had. Mm. And I got there and they said he had just gone out. So I assumed he will be back soon. So I waited. I, I chose to wait. 1995 is not exactly 2020 where you had cell phone and you could reach anybody. Yeah, there was so a nobody, lot of waiting going Nobody on. could reach him, you know. So by 5.30, they were ready to close and they said, look, gentlemen, you have to go now. We're, we're closing for the day. I didn't have any money to go back to Malta where I came from. So uh, <laughs> I had two choices. Either to go approach his colleagues and say, Sorry, I have no money. Or tell them some cock book story about how I lost my wallet getting there. 
or just hit the road and start walking back to mile two. I'm trying to visualize that what sort From of distance. From our papa, it's, 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 uh, I mean, a it's. A papa mile two. Mile two is that place where the traffic never moves. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's still why I hate to go there still today. So I chose the long way home. I just started walking and I just kept asking him for direction. But I remember getting to a certain place between a papa and mile two. And in that place, there was a little place where they excavate sand from the from the lagoon there. And I and I, just, I said to myself, Oh, I saw some people hauling sand, bring they'll bring sand from the from the bottom of the lagoon and they put it. And I remember saying to myself, Well, I've been in this town for two months. And I still don't have a job. If everything fails, I, I come here and I help them move sand from the lagoon and earn some money. I, it did occur to me. Did you ever have to do it? No, thankfully not. Because <laughs> I'm not sure I'll have survived. <laughs> that would have been a very good story. Though, but really. I used to tell myself, though, every morning I wake up in the morning and I mm. say to myself, I look at myself in the mirror, eyeball myself, before I leave this town and not be successful. You rather hold the sand? No, the the bar beach will run dry. I used to say it to myself repeatedly before mm. I leave this town and be as unsuccessful. The bar beach will run dry. I didn't even know how it's going to happen, but I knew it had to happen. You know, so I use that to motivate myself every morning. And I even till now. Well, I, so much. I don't have too much time. To, <laughs> <laughs> I got I got so caught up in so much work now, but yeah. Not even because I'm successful yet. I, I I think I'm work in progress, but yeah. Not so much these days, but then, yeah. It's, it's remarkable, Steve. It uh-huh. really is remarkable. So let's delve in a little bit into the advertising game. Sure. Into comms. Um, so having gone in, I know, I know that comms itself is it's a big boys game. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. know this. So it's, I, a, it's a bloody sport as well. It's you have to have the heart for you it. You have to have the heart mm-hmm. for it. You have mm-hmm. to have that resolve that you know it's I'm going to win or I just mm-hmm. don't even bother getting out sure. of bed. In the years that you've been in the industry, um, how how have you found that journey for yourself? Because it, I, I'm, because you've never you haven't really done anything else, really, have no, you? This no. is the only industry you've really ever worked in, and you've been advancing, and advancing as Absolutely. to the point where we're now the you know Triple A M president. <laughs> <laughs> Let's brag a little bit, you know. So having been dedicated to that industry, to, to this particular industry for such a long time. How has the transition been? Because I'm an outsider coming mm-hmm, in. Mm-hmm. I don't know so much about the advertising space in Nigeria before the 20, 2000 and some things. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how has it transit? How, how has it changed for you over the years? And it, how's that journey been? It's been exciting. Uh, bittersweet sometimes, you know, but I think more sweet than bitter. Honestly, I think the moment I hit MCN and I start working, I, I I just knew. You know, in Germany, you 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 drive your way and you get to the autobahn, mm-hmm. which is like the real expressway. There are no speed limits, right? You know, you just cruise. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's what happened to me with my career. The moment I hit the autobahn. I just I just put my foot, step my foot on the pedal, and I, I'm not taking it off since then. You know, mm. every day is a new challenge. Every day is hard work. I've had it had uh, uh, to overcome certain hurdles, and I, I I think I aced most of them. You know, and I'm really excited because this industry gave me everything. It's given me everything so far. You know, MCN five years I was there. You know, I remember in my for six months, I was the first creative person to ever go to finance department and ask them, how are we doing? Hmm. Billing versus focus. The first day, I, I remember that day like yesterday. And the 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 accountant almost fell off his chair. Hey, what are you doing A here? creative person coming to ask us billing versus focus. What, do you, what yes. do you even know about billing versus focus? But then I knew enough to know that every year we make certain forecast. Mm-hmm. of how much money we're about to generate that will help us pay our bills. And then the billing itself is how much we've made. So, And I just wanted to know because if we're falling behind, then I know I need to pay more attention to all the briefs I'm getting that will help us make more money. 
Mm. But as a creative person, I realized that that you have to just keep your eye on the t- bottom dollar. You know, I, for me, it was clear. Most creative people get maligned by saying, oh, creative people are not business people. They don't understand it. But I did understand it in my first, first six months. So I spent five years there and I got to Primaganet. I had to move to Primaganet eventually. Mm. You know, I spent another five years and I got seconded to one for one. I spent seven years as creative director and then we set up Extreme. So it's been, I, I've had to like pass all of the tests to get here, but for whatever I've done, I'm really ever grateful to the advertising industry for forging my mental resilience, my attitude, my drive, my eagerness, mm. my passion for this profession. It's with all of the problems you see coming into this game, I'm grateful, really. That's all I can say. I really will say I'm grateful. And we've done a lot, we've worked on a lot of campaigns, built lots of brands, but you know. Yeah, it's... it's so you held on. I held on. You, see, you and held not on, many and I think people, that's where the, the critical many, part of many it. Pe- not many people can ha- hold on, you know. Most that people, is, that's where the magic happens. It's that tenacity to hold, to on, hold you know. on. Most people just don't have that mental strength to, to go through it. Is that people are just pissed off with some of the BS that happens in the industry. And yeah. you say, look, I've, I've had it. But at the end of the day, if you hold on and you're able to persevere, I think the prize, the prize is the payout is yeah, good. It's worth it because five years. You know, we hire people all the time, and I see CVs. And one of the the de- deterrents for me when I read a CV is one year here and one year no, there, yeah. six yeah. months there. That already tells me that you're not willing to hold on, and you're not necessarily in it um, for for the industry. You're probably just and you you know people hop from industry to industry. Mm-hmm. But I think there is something to be said about people who do hold on. There's a lot of conversation that people do have, you know, about how long should you stay in a in in, yeah. in, a, in a company? Yeah. How long is too long? Um, how 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 long is too little? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you're really horned in mm-hmm. on a particular industry, yeah. you want to see it through the long haul. Holding on is very critical it because is. I can imagine from Sashi to Sashi and then Primo Gannett, mm-hmm. the lessons that would have you would have learned through the BS. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of lessons. Because there's yeah. also a lot of BS. Of course. The lessons you would have learned through the BS would have been just mind blowing yeah, in, sure. in terms of changing. I don't know, there's something critical that happens at every step of the way that is that the wisdom is deeper. You're right. Yeah, so you know, the you're insight so, is you're deeper. You're so right, and, and I tell people, especially in the same industry, one thing that I realized very early in my career is that, as far as it's the same industry, it's different toilet, same crap. Okay, yes. you just have to make up your mind, which toilet do I want to take the crap? Okay, so nothing. Is good. You're just going to be trading problems, so you leave agency A because there's they have one issue. You go to agency B. Mm. Maybe they don't have that issue that chased you away from agency A. They have three other challenges that you, you didn't have in agency A. Yes. Now, you don't have to deal with the challenges you had in agency A and agency B. But here it comes the three-headed monster in agency B mm. that you didn't see in agency A. So you're going to leave agency B and go to agency C. There are five new challenges that are waiting for you that are different from the ones you've seen from agency <laughs> and agency <laughs> B. So you're just going to keep running and yeah. chasing shadows all your life. For, so all intents and purposes, I think I probably worked in three agencies in my 25 years adver- advertising career till today. Then I had cali- colleagues who belonged to the same class of 95 when, we st- when I started my career, who before I did my first two or three years in MCAD, I jumped to 10 agencies. Yes. No kidding. But now, if I sit back and look back, I really don't see those guys anymore. Because you burn out. They've disappeared, but we're still here because we persevered and we learned our lessons. But did you make that decision very early on that, that you were going to just put up and almost put up and shut up and just keep going until you have that breakthrough. Did you make up your mind very early I to did. do that? I did. And one, not consciously, not deliberately, mm. one of the, but one of the things that, that helped me make, make up my mind that way was, I'm not the kind of guys that like meeting new people, really. 
even though meeting me for the first time, you probably never realize this. Because if I meet you, if I know you, I don't know you, I'm going to... Make you feel very welcome. Absolutely. With the broadest smile that I have, and I'm going to receive you well. But I hate the fact that I was going to get introduced in another agency as a new guy, and I'll be forced to say, please to meet you, when I know I'm not pleased to meet anybody. <laughs> so are, you a, are you a bit of an introvert then? Most people still won't believe it, but honestly, I'm introverted and I'm very shy. Oh, wow. But most people would never believe it, they'll say. But then he works in advertising. Well, yeah, so <laughs> I've learned to do all the window dressing that will make me look like... Your functional introvert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, fabulous. So we know that human human resource is a massive problem mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in this environment. And That's we've so been true. having this conversation um, everywhere, everybody from industry to industry, everybody's having this conversation. Sure. Where is the talent? How can we how can we not only grab the talent, how can we hold on to the talent? Um, how can we find the guys who are willing to hold on mm. through the BS and mm. just and just make sure that we just we just we're plowing at this thing. Mm. We're plowing, we're plowing and we're improving all the time mm. and we're willing to put in the work that is required to have that breakthrough sure, in, sure. across industries. Uh-huh. You know, in terms of comms, how have you guys found that um, that challenge to be, and how has the industry possibly changing over the years to a, maybe improve it or somehow change it? How 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 is that happening on your end? It's it's a big challenge across um, maybe any sector you look at in Nigeria. You know, because limited, we, you know, back in back in the days, people used to say, "Oh, Nigeria has." employment crisis but uh I, I, a gentleman i can't really remember his name now said look it's the problem is not that nigerians have employment crisis the problem is that nigerians we have lots of nigerians that are unemployable they may have gone to school they may have gotten the necessary certification you see does not make them employable and I, I, it's true. So what what is what is it do you think that is making them very, or should I say, what, what's making us so unemployable? Because the educational system has crashed. We've not done much to, to solve the educational crisis we have. We have about over 10 million out-of-school children in this country, which statistics shows to be the highest in the world. Even against numbers like India or China that have like oh, wow. over a billion in population. So that's 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 just chaos. So we have an idiot bomb ticking at the moment where people are out of school and they really don't they they're not equipped for tomorrow. Tomorrow is gonna to come, a new set of entrepreneurs will have to hire people. Some of those people are gonna fall through the cracks and you have to hire them. Or you have to at least attempt to interview to hire them and then you realize that the problem is not that people are not <laughs> we have an unemployment. The problem is that majority of our people are unemployable. If you look at the statistics and see how much money countries like Ghana and Benin Republic make from Nigerians just going out there to seek education and certification, it's mind blowing. Because hmm. I would have thought the educational system here is, I, I see a lot of very intelligent Nigerians. When, the, when, when, when people, and that is not to say there are still not a lot of brilliant Nigerians in Nigeria. Of course, they're, they're, we, I think naturally we're blessed. We have lots of really brilliant minds but here. But we can't rely on just talent. We have to... Talent is not enough. Work, yes. We still have to like hone those talents and just the infrastructure to hone our talents and make them come to the best of that they, are, they possibly can be. It's just what's lacking here. So if the, if the educational system is not functional, half of the time they're on strike. Now you have to go to private universities, how many of the low to middle income families can afford to send their kids to those schools? Even the ones owned by some churches mm. are still above the reach of low to medium income families in Nigeria. So that those are the those are the challenges we have. And unless we are able to solve it, we, we we're still gonna be we're still gonna be grappling with a human resource problem in every sector. Because now what? Now let's bring it down to the advertising industry. What we've done is basically to sec, to circulate the same talents 
across different agencies. So it means this guy comes to agency one. Agency one pays him 10 naira. And then agency two says, oh, He's willing that's to the talent they have. Yeah. Please add two naira to his 10 naira. His, and they make it 12 naira. He jumps to agency two. Agency three, excuse me, sees that and say, okay, make it 15 naira. So now the agencies are busy gutting each other because we have to get talent. The talents we have are limited in numbers. The pool is, the, 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 the talents in the pool are limited. So let me just get and kidnap just any other talent somebody, I can yeah. see. So we're poaching each other and then we're busy making enemies of each, each other instead of us cooperating. And I can tell you now it's, that was when the going was good. Now it's so bad that now the clients have joined the fray. In terms of poaching? Because the clients can no longer find the requisite talents to fill their own sector. So they are poaching from the their own agencies. That is rather disturbing. Yeah, very. So, and I can tell you that's that's the story in most. So sectors. how do, how do we get around that? Is is it because I I'm not with education. Education I feel like is is one part, mm-hmm. but I think there's a there's a certain freedom of creativity sure. that also needs to be really. Mm-hmm. Um, horned and really giving close attention to because you can be as educated as possible but we don't have the freedom of creativity yeah you're almost kind of borderline useless to that, a creative space as that's well what, that's what's actually chasing some of the talents from advertising to go to the client side so if i'm going to be killing creative i'd rather be killing it as a client than killing it as the guy who is holding the stillborn that the client has killed Okay, that was that was a, a mind play, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try and understand. Yeah, that. <laughs> so so you know what I mean. So now most creatives now are saying, look, people in the advertising sector, let me go to the client side. They are the ones who are accused of killing all the ideas. So let let me not be holding the child while the idea is killed. Okay, you know what I mean. So, but but now. I, I, I tell people, like for some me, I may have a creative purist. I, I always knew from the one, there's no amount of money, even when I was coming up in the game, in this industry, no amount of money that a client could have paid me that would make me switch side and go to a client side. That's, that's, that power to create, that power to give life to a brand is what makes me do what I do. It's what makes me enjoy what I do. I'm not going to trade it to just sitting down in the chair and pointing fingers and pretending to do something. So yeah, I mean, shout out to the guys on the client side, but I've always, always loved the agency side. My job is supposed to support the client and make make the brand grow, you know, and and, I, and I've chosen to, to keep faith with my hmm. with my path. So we, like, like we were talking about earlier, um, advertising is a big boy. It's a big boy game. Yeah. Us little ones don't really stand much of a chance. Um, but in, in terms of comms and, you know, with the whole COVID mm-hmm. shift at the moment, sure. um, where a lot of small businesses are now realizing the 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 currency that comes with really pushing your brand out mm-hmm. there as much as possible. Mm-hmm. If you don't have necessarily the, the budgets of the government, because really those are the ones who pay for advertising mm-hmm. and comms um, to, to that level, these massive um, you know, companies who have juggernaut budgets and things like that, that we smaller companies can't necessarily compete with. But from an advertising stance, what do you think smaller companies need to be doing now, especially with post COVID-19, um, to stand a chance of not necessarily competing because we, we quite frankly we can't on that sort of scale mm-hmm. but what are the things that we should be doing now um to sort of position ourselves as well so we don't get completely you know just pushed aside and we are able to obviously survive and and, and get some of that market share yeah it's a very important question to be honest you know i i think all of those excuses, and that's what I call them, excuses of, oh, we don't ha- we're not big people, we don't have budget, blah, blah, blah. Ah, we can't. This, this, the big boys are talking again. No, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> all those excuses should be something gone with the wind and should stay in the past. You know, what COVID has done, all of the whole ideas we used to think are in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is going to happen in the future, in the next five years, six years. What COVID has done is to literally roll back the time. So they're happening today. We're forced 
if this was not important for us to use all these your high tech gadgets that you are using for your podcast before we try oh. <laughs> we try at <it>, <laughs> we'll probably be doing this online somewhere and just talking chatting with you that I, I done i've done a couple of days not just remotely you know that's what's happening today that's the reality of our world so what we must do and there's a movie i can't really remember it has a uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in it the this sci-fi sci-fi yeah the, the uh, I, my mind went straight to titanic no no, no that, that's <laughs> it's when, hardly sci-fi yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so there's the line in the movie that says an idea when it grips hold of your mind it expands your mind and your mind never goes back to being the same there are certain things that covid has forced on upon us today we'll never go back to being our world will never go back to being what it used to be this is the time for a small medium scale businesses to seize the opportunity there's so much opportunity within that digital space you know to 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 really for us to focus on and develop and build our brands like i told you your furniture company for instance the first time i had an encounter nobody told me about it i saw it on instagram i'm like well okay they do this thing let me call them and so then i can swear to you I have don't have one single furniture that was not made out of your company till today. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Did, did you guys all hear that? <laughs> Steve is a fan of Majors. <laughs> that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. So more people push you. And I don't even know what you guys did. But the only thing that I know you guys did that I saw was that I saw your communication. I saw the the pictures and I made some calls and the conversation was good for, enough for me to keep patronizing till today. Okay. So that's what more younger businesses should do. Don't don't underplay yourself or underestimate yourself because there are no local businesses anymore. Mm. In that digital spot where you stand, every local business is a global business because whatever it is you're doing in Lagos, Nigeria is seen by the whole world. And it's just to have a little bit more self-confidence and be more sure to be able to put yourself and what you do under their click likes to for the whole world to see that's the most important part of what needs to be done today so be willing to just be, willing to be, just be willing to be daring and, and to just put yourself out there absolutely that's all but we don't we don't need to worry too much about the finesse the 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 packaging and no. things because that's what intimidates a lot of people that my product is not ready my business is not ready you know, I, i don't want anybody to judge me too soon because i'm not perfect you know, yet you know what i love the tech people for it's the same thing you've said they're gonna know okay we're not really fully ready but roll out the roll out the program roll out the product and then they're gonna say oh we have an ios upgrade in six mm. months and another six months there's another upgrade to fix bugs and whatever all of those things that you guys were complaining about in six months six months ago we we've, we've fixed we've improved the product mm. to fix it now but sometimes people just are so intimidated to think oh i want my room to be built on the first day it's not going to happen absolutely it's i absolutely happen, agree you know mm. so just be there and put it out there as long as you know okay the product is decent it can it can solve certain problems that people have to they pull it out and then keep gradually upgrading and you know fixing it as you go along keep upgrading yourself as as uh, as you progress through the if journey i saw the first picture of uh the amazon guy yeah oh, yeah is that is that the one in the room with the little Ridic- with a piece of paper Ridic- on the wall with Very, the handwriting absolutely Amazon. ridiculous <laughs> i think the n was actually off the page absolutely you can imagine <laughs> if the man was waiting for him to be able to write the best sign the guy who still won't be in business today absolutely see but it's a very very inspiring image though and mm-hmm. i think a lot of us um we need that reminder sometimes don't we yeah. because it's weird because we we ha- I have these conversations um with my with my friends um also in business and we always kind of debate are you a perfectionist or are you just petrified in nigeria we have both the combination of being a perfectionist and being scary cats you know a lot of people want to do business here you know but i must also say that there's been everything that happens in Nigeria the tendency is for that thing to be abused i think entrepreneurship has been abused here you know where you find a motivational speaker telling you oh, no 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 you were born to do this if you don't build your dream you other people will employ you to build this i think the whole lot of hogwash mm. 
not everybody in this world will be an entrepreneur, period. Some people will help other people to build their dreams. Well, we can't all be business owners. But Who's now, going to do the work? What the motivational speakers are trying, the lie they are telling people is that we are all born to be entrepreneurs. It's not true. There's something called entrepreneurship hmm. where you can have a stake in a company like either yours or mine and then do so work and be so exceptional and be so dependable and reliable that you have a stake in the business, you have shares in the company. You Many are, people have gone on to do that. You are an entrepreneur. Hmm. You see, and I want us to pay focus. Let's not look at people who don't own their business as if they're deformed or they have some form there's of a lot of shaming going on it, it, if, if you don't own a if you don't own a business you're not doing it's, anything it's not worthwhile r- it's so ridiculous it's not right i mean you have the capital the capital city of capitalism itself maybe in america or in europe a lot of people don't even own their businesses they work in businesses and help those businesses to get along so i think this is the time to talk to do that reality check and understand that if you choose to own your own business, it's fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. But if you also choose to work for a company knowing your own capacity and know that you really can run a business and build that dream to the point where you become part of a stakeholder in mm. that business, it's also good enough. It's, it's good fantastic. enough. It's awesome. You know, nothing wrong with that. Let nobody fool you and railroad you into thinking Oh, we are all born to do this. You can do this. And if you don't do it, you you failed somehow. Yeah, I think that needs to change, though. I think that yeah. needs to change. We were having a conversation in the previous um, episodes where we were talking about: Are you, are you, are you made for entrepreneurship, or are you made for the nine to five? If you're made for the <laughs> nine to five, just do no the shame. nine to five no with a hundred and twenty percent. There's absolutely no shame, no shame in that. In it. You know, it's awesome. You know, do it. But if you also are driven and you know you have that entrepreneurship blood in you, by all means, go out there and conquer. You and know. don't let being the, the, the fear of perfection Absolutely. make you so scared you yeah. don't actually do anything yeah. about it at all. So you just have to just spread your wings and, and fly. Fantastic. Yeah. So what's the future for Extreme Idea? With, with this new, with, with our new normal, this is the new normal. It is. Everything has changed. It is. Is, is it changed much in your industry? It is because for the past four months, going on five now, we've been working from home. So, and I, I think it's the same thing for most agencies. You know, we've been working from home and uh, you know trying to keep our people safe. You know, so but, but for us, for the future of extreme, yeah, it's, 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 I think the future looks bright. It looks bright. It looks definitely looks bright from where I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> it looks it looks very, very, very bright. You know, so I mean so far we, we have uh uh we have presence in two other countries apart from Nigeria in Johannesburg in South Africa and in Lusaka Zambia. And we'll see the COVID thing has slowed uh um uh, our rollout plan to other parts of Africa. But yeah, with I, I just believe in Africa. I believe in just this one continent where we can do business together as a, as Africans. If you look at it, if you look at all the continents of the world and the intertrade happening in most continents, you find that Africa has the lowest lowest intertrade within within, within Africa. Yes, within, the within continent the, itself. Yeah, it's appalling. It's horrible. And then you're talking about 1.2 billion to 1.3 billion people. You really don't need any outsiders to trade with. If you get ten wow. percent or twenty percent of these that figures are mind blowing. It's it, it's got see, it's gotten my entrepreneurial juices flowing. We don't see it because now in Africa you find that so many of the impediments we have is even let's even talk of travel. It's easier to go from here to Dubai or to go then from here to, go to, to, to Europe Africa, than yes. to go from here to Tanzania. Yes. You know, I, I wanted to go to Zamb- uh, Zanzibar recently. I had to go through Dubai with Emirates. We really need to look at that. So you see, that's the problem. We really do need to look at that. Now, is that the air architecture, whatever it is that they call it? We need to overhaul that stuff and make it more accessible. We need to uh, the the free trade agreement in Africa. We need to Nigeria has signed off. Really South huge, Africa has yes. signed off. Let's keep it. Let's roll it off. You know, and be able to do business because create opportunities for Africans. 
you know, it, it's so horrible here that we have a system where with all of the the looting of our economy happen, happening in politics and in governance. You know, I'm not even speaking to any particular government in specifically that from all of the track records we, we've had, not necessarily in Nigeria, across the continent, people, mm-hmm. governments steal money and you take that money to go and develop Europe and Europe America and, because yes. you put this money there and you leave our people impoverished. All this needs to stop, you know, because all of the money we get you be to develop the motherland where you, we can create opportunities for our brothers and sisters and lift up and lift each other up. And Nigeria recently became like the poverty capital of the world where you have the largest preponderance of poor people in the world. That's really worrying. My, and we shocking. see it everywhere. We, it's all around us every so day. So I just feel that, look, for me, I'm Pan-African in my view. I don't care where you come from. All of this argument and debate about who has the best jollof. I'll leave it to the other guys. Well, I, I, just, think, I, I think everybody has their days. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to be able to do business and create opportunity for my fellow Africans. And if I'm able to do that, I, I'm a happy man. I think that that would be a wonderful, mm. wonderful future yeah. that I would I would love to see for all of us Absolutely. within Africa. Because while we're creating the debate about, oh, my jollof is better than yours, Heinz goes to make a jollof uh, package, and they're now making, they're mo- they're making the money off our, off our arguments. Argument. That has actually happened, isn't it? Ha- it? it has I happened. think I've seen a jollof Indomie too. Oh, definitely. Well, I can even, <laughs> I can even spare Indomie because the those ones are based in Africa. But I mm. mean, what do we say for Heinz? It's quite disturbing. Very. Very, very disturbing. So yeah. we definitely need more innovation. We need more focus. Absolutely. We need more love. Amongst, within, amongst Africa, um, and, and not just a case of Ghana versus Nigeria no, or whatever. Are, Africa those, is Africa. The are, continent those, is a those continent. Those are for, for, for absolute waste yeah, of time. Waste of time, waste of energy, really. Mm. So if somebody's a young spirit yeah. who, who sees something in themselves as relatively um, close to, what, to the story that you've described today mm-hmm. and your humble beginnings and... And, and they just have this raging pa- like passion to just do something, not quite sure what they want to do, mm-hmm. but they're listening in, you know, young person, young at heart, young in spirit. What, what would be the, the advice that you would give them? Nike gave that advice before I, I can ever think of it. Let's rehash it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You know. That's okay. <laughs> Just do it. As long as it's positive, it's not going to harm anybody. It's positive. It's not but negative. But what if they don't know what they actually want to do? To be honest, take a take you, a bus you know and go to Lagos. I know now. What I know now. Most people who have become successful, your favorite, my favorite, that we all admire across the world today. I promise you, half the time they didn't know what they were doing. I didn't. I still don't know what I'm doing. But the, I'm, I'm definitely going to keep doing it. Bingo! There you are. You know the thing is, just spread your wings and fly. We take sometimes we take life too seriously. Hmm. But what if I fail? What if I? But what if you fly? And most of the guys who we see in the stratosphere flying today is because they just spread their wings and they took a risk, right? Take it. Obsessed? Are you still obsessed with taking risks at this stage? I can't stop. Yeah. I can't stop. You know, I'm even going into other industries that I can't even speak about today. Yes. That people would think if I were to confess to you and say, this is what I'm doing, you say, you're insane. Yeah. I would, I would never say that. <laughs> but I, I see what you're saying there. Because we've got, we've already got music under the belt. We've got agriculture under the Absolutely. belt. What else? Are you going to give us a little sneak peek? I can't. <laughs> Unfortunately. Nothing at all. Oh. I can't. I, I tried, guys. I, I don't tried. Want, I don't want the guys who are bigger than me to go and wait for me. Oh, at the does gate. that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I understand. Let's, yeah. let's not delve into yeah. too prematurely. Yeah. So, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. Same here. It's been an absolute Thank pleasure chatting so with you. Um, you. It'd be lovely, really, if somebody was listening and, and they just took that leap of faith and just did it. Because Honestly. That's really, that's really all it is, isn't it? Don't do it for me. Don't do it for your mother. Do it for yourself. I write your own history. I mean, Alexander the Great was like in his 30s when he conquered the entire world. Mm. He didn't even have a Google map to navigate his way. He found it. See, that's awesome. Absolutely fantastic. It's a great way to go, isn't it? The journey that just keeps giving. At least you write your name in gold and in history. Fantastic.
Is there any opportunities for that you that you guys are doing at Extreme for young people? Any opportunities? Can somebody just come to your office and you just give them a test? I <laughs> not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but I mean, if you if you are interested, that you reach out to us. I'm sure there's a way we can. We we've, we've done it in the past. We always give people internship opp- opportunities if so, they're brave enough. Yeah, if they're brave enough, just follow it through and don't say, oh, they didn't reply me once, and then you give up. You, nothing comes easy. And know? let me just tell you guys, don't be asking for no five thousand naira. You no, will not you, get it. You're not gonna get it. I'm <laughs> even looking for five thousand myself, even right now. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. Bye bye, it's been an absolute pleasure Thank today. Thank you so much. Thank you.